If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be panic-inducing, and here's why. In this episode, we find some answers to how can casting cause fear pack some more punch? And what are some psychological effects of fear that can give your roleplay more weight? And what are some of the creepiest things in the animal kingdom where animals actually cause fear in others? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. Today, we're kind of doing a lot with this podcast episode. Yeah, this is like the the blanket one where we just kind of grab a whole smattering (laughs) of spells and conditions and all kinds of stuff, and we just toss it into a mixer, and we shake it up, and we pour ourselves a fine cocktail of fear. Yeah, ooh, that sounds spicy and exotic. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like a terrible hangover. Mm -hmm. So what are you afraid of? What fears you? Um, like all the normal stuff. Confrontations. <laughs> heights. <laughs> sure. Spiders in your veins. You've got larger medical problems than fear if you've got <laughs> spiders in your veins. That's fair, but just imagine it. Seeing them crawl around. Under okay, your... all right. No, no, we're done. I. We should honestly probably throw a content warning Or like some kind of trigger warning for all of the fearful things that humans are afraid of. Yeah, that's fair. If you're afraid of stuff, be aware going forward in this episode. (laughs) What about you, Travis? Uh, Well, despite my family, our wonderful parents, perpetuating my supposed fear of needles that I had as a child into adulthood, I actually have gotten over my fear of needles. Congrats. Uh, I've got lots of tattoos, and that was the joke that they always made. They were like, hey, you've got tattoos, so you, it's strange that you're afraid of needles. And it was like, well, I'm not actually, because I got thousands <laughs> of them in one sitting. Uh, but dentists still wig me out. Fair enough. I feel like that's one of those somewhat common, uncomfortable things in our world. Well, I mean, mine's rooted in a, in a true deep fear of uh, an experience where I had and uh, so here's here's your first trigger warning, by the way, uh, if you're afraid of dentists or tooth pain, is that I underwent surgery to remove some tooth nerves when I was like a 12 year old or something like that. And the local anesthesia wore off in the oh. middle of the procedure. And me being 12 didn't really understand that that wasn't how it was supposed to feel. And so I just sat there having cold sweats and gripping the the seat and the dentist was like is there anything anything oh. wrong and i i don't know i just didn't have the the wherewithal to say uh no i'm in incredible pain because you're tweezing out my <laughs> goddamn nerves oh god how does so. this feel i'll play a little tune on it <laughs> but ding 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 <laughs> i have a legitimate fear of dentists because yeah. i was tortured by one that's a horror story moment <laughs> For sure. Anyways, what should adventurers be afraid of? Pretty much everything they ever encounter, (laughs) I think. That's the correct answer, yes. Like giant spiders, edder caps, beholders, pit traps. I mean, when you live in a world where everything is out to kill you, yeah, yeah, you should probably have some deep-seated fears. I don't know how like common villagers make it (laughs) in the D&D world. I'm just a farmer, man. I'm not equipped. (laughs) this i only have a strength of 10 hello adventurer i saw the shadows staring at me and i know it's real because of our world because our world sucks i hate this yeah every day is a trial that would be rough but the frightened condition that is one that i kind of personally have a, a bit of a grudge with because what it amounts to in gameplay is uh hey i'm afraid okay well, there goes all of my combat options. Um, my character, my my bold and brave hero 
is now uh, soiling himself and is unable to attack his target. And uh, for all intents and purposes, I can't like move closer and should probably just run away uh, and cry. Like well, I a mean, baby. if you're a melee fighter, you can't attack. You can still throw some stuff from afar. But I get what you mean. It's a mechanical inconvenience when really I would argue that fear is the emotional crux of the entire dungeon delving adventuring experience. hundred <laughs> percent because like you either lean into this from a role playing perspective or if you are a frontline melee fighter and you have fear cast on you, you sit there and you zigzag in a line unable to get any closer to your target <laughs> like you're waiting on Boxing Day to shop at Target. And you're just like, <laughs> they're going to open in five minutes and then I'm going to rush. Right. You're you're acting like there's an invisible wall, not like you're afraid of the massive beast in front of you that's snarling and drooling and is going to tear you limb from limb. Exactly. We're just, as players, we just go, okay, can't wait for this condition to be over so that yeah. my DM can stop being a dick and I can be a hero. So that's why we want to take the time in this episode to talk about how to actually role play and make it into a part of your character and to tell a story with fear. Well, I mean, it is a role playing game, so I suppose we should do a little bit of that. <laughs> sure. And before we get into this, dear listener, I would love to implore you. Uh, if you have the ability, if you have the time and you are able, you're like you're sitting down and you're not driving, and you're not at risk of maiming anybody, uh, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, whatever you got around you, and we're going to make some notes throughout this episode. And if you're driving or you're not able to do that, then don't stop the episode. Keep listening, because you're still going to get a lot <laughs> from this. But then come back and check out the show notes afterwards, because we'll add some of these steps in there. But this is going to be really, really valuable if you're a player, and if you're a DM, and you're just wanting to like figure out what the hell to do in those like three and a half turns that you're going to be trying to make your save so that you can go and attack again. Yeah, because again, it's suggesting this condition is suggesting that you're going through one of the most terrifying moments of your entire life. It should have a little more impact. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about the actual condition. So frightened. Right. So here it is. A frightened creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight and the creature can't willingly move closer to the source of its fear. So yeah, that, that just feels like an inconvenience. Worse at attacking, can't go closer. Got it. And then we've got cause fear, which is a whole nother spell. You can go around and you can give this to people, this wonderful uh, malady of not being able to make these kind of attacks. Yeah. And just for reference, this one's in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. But the basics of it are the target has to succeed on a wisdom saving throw or become frightened of you until the spell ends. They get to try again on each of their turns. That's basically it. Yeah. You can cast it at a higher level and affect a few other people. Or you can just cast the spell Fear and affect a whole bunch of people in a cone. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunities that you're going to have to react to fear is, I guess, what we're saying here. And we might as well prep for it. And DMs, you've got a whole whack of monsters that can cause fear in different ways. Like, there's all these different abilities. It would take the length of this episode to describe each of them to <laughs> you. So we'll let you discover those on your journey through the Monster Manual. But to make this the most impactful and the quickest turnaround to value in terms of your game... It really does boil down to just five steps, and we're going to get into that in Kinship Camp. This is Kinship Camp, where rich histories and diverse quirks are explored between weary adventurers around the safety of the fire. So we're going to talk about that moment of fear. Like, we're talking about the moment in the combat and just after it, that you're experiencing fear and you're dealing with it right then and there. And to do that, we're going to use the structure of an episode that we did recently, number 126, the five steps to every story, because this five-step framework 
works so well for thinking about basically any part of your game. And I'll quickly recap those steps. You got the inciting incident, the challenges, the choice, the action, and the aftermath. And I think all this really illustrates is that what we're trying to do in any moment, as far as role playing goes, is we're trying to tell a story. And a story can, you know, take place within a single sentence, or it can take place over the course of many, many months of playing D&D. These are the five steps that underlie every single story in existence. Like, it, it's weird how much you can apply these to any kind of scenario that you're trying to tell a story. And it's really fun to watch movies with this in mind, but that's an aside. So we're going to start with the inciting incident, which is the moment that fear is caused. If the spell is cast, if the ability is triggered, whatever. So let's talk about what you as the player can do when you're casting fear as a spell. One of the descriptions that we really like from those spells is you awaken the sense of mortality in one creature you can see within range. See, I love that. You awaken the sense of mortality. like. There is a sense of immediate impending doom in this scenario. What is that scenario? Well, it's probably fighting a monster. Like, there are dire consequences. You could yeah. end up with a total party kill. There is not a huge leap to say, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm reminded that I'm just flesh <laughs> and I could easily be killed. Yeah. You know each of those claws that's the size of a spear? <laughs> that could go right through my body. That takes us to the, the types of fear. Like, these are the kind of things that trigger a deep-seated fear in humans. Is the fear of extinction, death, the fear of mutilation. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that you could live through some terrible things done to your yeah. fleshy meat. <laughs> body this meat vessel and, it, and that hurts like you, you know like when an owlbear grabs each hand and sees where they can go sure <laughs> there's a loss of autonomy so losing that ability to control yourself a la fear <laughs> yeah not being able to get closer to your target there's the fear of separation and being othered and like thrown out on your own in that loneliness and that inability to connect to other humans yeah. so we're like, talking about being sent to another dimension in D, D terms there's some spells that do that hell yeah but in fear terms we're talking about just you don't feel like a part of your party anymore all of a sudden and then there's finally ego death that's where you lose your sense of self you lose some part of yourself that feels core to your identity which is what we deal with a lot in our real lives you know humiliation shame things like that this you, is the paladin running scared when they're supposed to be a brave and confident paladin. Yeah. All of a sudden, they've forsaken their oath and they feel like a complete failure. So there is a lot of different ways that fear can creep into us. But underlying all of that is that that intrinsic mortality. If we weren't mortals, say like a construct <laughs> of some kind, we might not fear ego death as much because... A construct maybe doesn't have that same kind of sense. But underneath all of this is that that sense of mortality and those different types of fear. So let's talk about some things that awaken that sense of mortality. I think it's best to do that with a character. And out of the two of us, the character that I think most embodies a sense of fear and spookies is your character Seven, Travis. Yes, uh, the <laughs> stereotypical rogue warlock. Uh, that is spooky and <laughs> mean, I guess. I don't know. Spooky and mean. I've, uh, over the years, I've definitely become more aware of how edgelord he <laughs> was originally made because he was like one of my original characters when I just started playing D&D. &D. Which I think is why he's the perfect example for the show because people know exactly who we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to, yeah, be very comfortable or familiar with him to know exactly what he's all about. Uh, yeah. So edgelord, uh, rogue, warlock, spooky, cool mercenary, wears a tricorn, and threatens people. So if he could cast these spells, what would he do? Well, very simply, like, without any spells, I can cause fear. If there's a, an ability that I have or, or anything that, 
you know, if I want to cast cause fear or fear or anything like that, all I have to do is, you know, if, if I've struck a recent hit or something like that and I've got blood on my sword, I flick it to the ground and I point my sword at him and I say, you're next. That's fearful. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe a little warlock flare smoke coming out. Sure. Yeah. Fingertip smoke <laughs> and red eyes flash because I cast prestidigitation or something. And I know that these spells aren't really illusion based spells, but with their descriptors being so loose and just causing that sense of mortality, I think you can get pretty dang creative and treat it almost like illusion spells. Like you could cause hallucinations in your target, I think. Like if if we talk about Batman again, which I know this is the umpteenth time we've done so. <laughs> Regular recurring guest. Um, in Batman Begins, you've got Scarecrow who releases his fear toxin and people in the streets see Batman, but he's not a man in a costume anymore. He's some creepy ass drooling leather faced bat monster demon thing yeah exactly so why can't seven be that to his foes specifically to that foe that he's casting the spell on absolutely yeah and i mean there's there's so many different ways like if he just i mean this is kind of gross but like if he just recently fell another enemy and now he's trying to impose fear on others like just step on the neck of the last guy that you down and you'd be like i mean business <laughs> that's gonna awaken some of that uh some of those fear characteristics in other players and characters around the table like you're gonna be able to go like oh yeah uh if he's doing that to somebody who's already downed uh he's probably pretty badass <laughs> i can I can kill corpses. What do you think of me now? <laughs> I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's that's the general gist of this first bit. The inciting incident is we're writing down for our characters. How do they incite fear? What do they do? What feature of the landscape? What spell? What weapon? What do they do? Do they hold their maul aloft and say, I will vanquish every evildoer in this cave? And that sends all of the troglodytes going, oh shit, he's going to smash me with that hammer. Yeah. Like anything. But we're writing this down so that when the time comes and we use fear in a game or the fear spell is used on us, we are ready for it. So we're writing down what is that inciting incident? And don't think that this is going to become like cliche or boring. I think this has potentially become one of your character's signature moments that everyone gets excited for when they do it again. Oh, yeah. Because they know what's coming. Yeah, I really dig that. But if I'm a DM, I'm going to do this for my monsters too. Right. So we got something like a dragon, which I think is a great example because so many of them have that radius of fear ability where, you know, being in front of a dragon is rather terrifying. That's what makes dragons so difficult to fight, is they're just like <laughs> casting fear without casting fear. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of a flavor can we throw on that dragon's cause fear? Because, I mean, as a DM, you have to do something more than the dragon is standing in front of you. You now are afraid. Well, I mean, the dragon crawls down off of its mountain of skulls and all of the bodies and bones of its previous victims crunch and squish beneath its four clawed toes that causes fear yeah <laughs> that is a radius fear effect that everyone if they have if they're in the right mind they're shitting their pants <laughs> right at that moment or to spice that up even more you know one of its claws gets stuck on a previous victim that's not totally skeletonized yet Ugh. and it tears it off with its mouth and the whole like it stretches the whole thing oh, out no if, thank you if that doesn't spook you nothing will or maybe the dragon exhales its breath being heavier than air weighing you down constricting you and stinking of meat as the dragon laughs about the fact that you can barely stand up to a wheeze <sighs> i <l> <laughs> Oh, man, that dragon, I'm outgunned. And that's considering those types of fear. Like I was thinking, how can I take away some mobility just with a, a flavor detail, not actually doing it? Totally. Or even from the like 
the precision effect. These, what we've been discussing, have been kind of like broadcast fear to everyone. Yeah. If we want to say precision target and we cast fear on a particular individual, the dragon's eyes narrow to slits and you know that the dragon is locked on to you. Yeah. He's coming for you first. And it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> and I could absolutely see even the toughest, most badass barbarian who's won countless fights is going to sit there and go, okay, should I stand my ground or should I retreat behind that pillar? Because clearly I have become something of an area of interest for this dragon. <laughs> And again, so you're playing off of the mechanics with your role play. So if your barbarian succeeds in the wisdom check, they can go in and raise their axe above their head and do the barbarian thing. But if you fail it, you got to role play it. Absolutely. This has got to land because either way, you're making more of this character. Yeah. You're either charging in headlong. And since the DM already set you up with this really cool intro, you are laughing in the face of certain death at the hands of a dragon who's clearly targeted you for imminent doom. And you were going in anyways, or, and very rightfully so, like we just said, you are taking cover behind that goddamn pillar. And the point I think I want to make is if you fail the fear check, you can't be the bold barbarian in that moment because you're mechanically constricted. Sorry, that option is cut off. So rather than just stand there and wait, let's have some fun. Let's role play. This is your opportunity to deepen the character and see the moment that they failed. Yeah. And have and give them something to work with, to overcome and to, re, you know, come back from in the eyes of the rest of the party when the barbarian turned tail and hid behind the pillar. Yeah. And real quick, I want to go over the descriptive details of fear hitting because I think this can help whether you're a DM trying to put a player in that mindset of fear rather than the mindset of bravery, or you're a player that's trying to convey how your, your character is reacting to the fear. So you got the physiological responses of tunnel vision, dry mouth, heart racing, nauseousness. Your hands get cold when you're afraid. You get a little lightheaded. You start to hyperventilate and your muscles tense. And I, I love that so much. Like, I can see my characters sitting there and, you know, they're trying to look brave in front of the rest of the party. But unfortunately, fear has taken a hold of my character. I failed the saving throw. And therefore, it doesn't matter how brave my character should be in my head. He's going to be sitting there and the rest of the party can see his sword trembling. He's standing his ground. He's using every bit of fortitude to stand in front of this terrifying thing, but unfortunately, his sword is shaking. Right. And hes you can see the cold sweat starting to come down off of his forehead. It's getting a little pale. pale. Yeah. yeah. Like, why not? And I can also see this being a really powerful tool from that DM's perspective of, you know, if I'm the DM playing the dragon against you, Travis, playing seven, I'm saying you can hear your heart beat faster in your ears as your vision closes in. Your stomach begins to churn as you erupt in a cold sweat. As your breathing becomes uncontrolled and rapid, you shake off the dizziness that is threatening to topple you. I think this kind of description just, just helps everyone get on the same page that this character is now afraid, which is really hard to do in some games. It's just a hard bridge to cross. And normally, as a DM, it's kind of a no-no to tell your players what they're experiencing. However, I would make the argument that in this moment, they are not in control of their character. <laughs> they are affected by fear. And therefore, you could be like, yeah, I don't give a shit. Your heart races. Yeah. And I'm not telling you what action to take next. I'm just telling you the physiological response that everybody has. We don't have control over that shit. Yeah. And neither does the player. All right. We've spent a lot of time in this inciting incident, but it was important. Moving on, though, to step two, the challenges. So first, we need to decide on a response for our character. We've made a note of what our character does to incite fear, but now we need to make a note of the response of 
having a panic effect. You know, what's happening inside our character? What are they doing when they lose control, when they're terrified of imminent death? Right. And I think what you're going to write down here is your panic move. And this boils down to what fear response you're going to have. And I know you've heard this before, but you've got the fight, flight, and freeze. Those are the three options that pretty much everyone takes. It's one of the three. I'm pretty sure mine is freeze or fight. I, I don't know. Uh, what, what is mine? What have you scared me? Have I ever struck you in the throat <laughs> as a result of a scare? What yeah. Are you? No, I would argue that yours, Travis, is definitely like an anger response. I would say it's fight. <laughs> you get pissed off real easy. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. Fair enough. Mine is turtling. Mine is freeze. It's definitely freeze. Yeah. It, it is drop into the fetal position yeah. uh, and try and weather the storm. Fainting goat style, <laughs> I call it. <laughs> Super effective. Yeah. But this is your opportunity to write down what does your character do? Every, every character is going to have one of these, one or two. And so just jot that down and they can look differently. Like, for instance, fight. What are some different ways that we could use fight? Right. So you're, you know, showing uncontrolled aggression towards this terrifying dragon, giving it threats of violence. You're using all of your top tier abilities. You're just slinging everything you got. And your party members might be like, whoa, chill. And this doesn't mean attacking the target because, of course, we're affected by fear in this moment. So this could be if we have that big ass hammer, that mull, we're just smashing it into the ground or we're smashing our own leg or we're, <laughs> we're just we're losing it. Like yeah. we are we're foaming at the mouth and we're swearing and we're ready, but we cannot move like we have to process this first, which gives us time to make our our check. And keep in mind that we're playing a fantasy role-playing game. So our advice here is go as hard as you can <laughs> into your response. Hell yeah. Make it dramatic. What about the flight response? Well, I can see this being, you know, desperate pleas to the rest of your party to abandon the situation. You could be, you know, of course, moving away from your source of fear, trying to find any kind of cover. You're using your more defensive abilities, even if it's not the smartest move, but you're trying to protect yourself at all costs. Well, you even just touched on it. Like, again, we, we're, not, we're not being told that we have to move away from our enemy. Right. So we don't want to, you know, use all of our move action. Yeah, to you're not just away. sprinting away. But you are standing there. You've got a cold sweat. You're looking panicked. You're kind of shaking. And like you said... To the rest of the party, you're going, you guys, we cannot win this. We have to leave. We've got to get out of here. Yeah. This is our last chance. You're losing it. Like you're losing all sense of composure. And that's your flight response. And finally, we have freeze, which might sound like there's no role playing opportunity here, but you do have to get a little more creative than the other two. Like you start by just standing there in wide eyed terror. You're trying to encourage your allies to hide as well. Like get down, stop, stop. Yeah. Yeah. That freeze response. I mean, we have disadvantage on any of our attacks anyways. Like this isn't going to go well. You can go ahead and roll those attacks, but if they both miss, you're still in the same place. So we can sit there and say, you know what? This isn't strategically advantageous to me, but you know what? I'm going to hold my action. I'm going to hold my attack because I am sitting there in wide eyed terror. My and muscles I'm, have all gone limp. And totally. I'm like, I'm totally defenseless in this moment. And that is something that, you know what? If we're going to talk about strategic advantage and what to do with our action economy in terms of role playing, and we are playing a role playing game, <laughs> and this is going to be a divisive topic. <laughs> and you and I even got into it a little bit. And even on our Discord, like this became a huge topic of conversation around sacrificing strategy for the sake of story. Having that moment where you sacrifice an action or two because you have disadvantage, your odds of getting a good hit on a goddamn dragon with an AC of 22 or whatever, you know, it's it's very unlikely that you're going to get that that you know crit hit. So, we can do a lot more in terms of story. 
In terms of standing there and showing the failure of our characters for a brief moment where they were utterly human, utterly shit scared, unable to move, completely paralyzed with fear, because that's going to be something that we can use again and again and again. And the next time we actually make that saving throw, the next time fear is cast on us and we roll really high and we make it, that is now a story of triumph and success. <laughs> because the last time you were in this position, you shat your pants and you stayed in the place. But now you're rising to the occasion and you're charging forward. And now your character has gone through a redemption arc all just because you sacrificed a turn. And I know that you might be out there saying my tactical gamer brain cannot handle this information because mine couldn't either. And <laughs> because like I, I do a mental shift when we're role playing and then initiative is rolled and I'm like, okay, tactics, I'll explain my tactics with character, but I will not sacrifice my tactics when it's all on the line in a dragon fight. I mean, that's totally fair. This could end up in a TPK if it weren't for that extra 10 damage that you're able to do if you manage to make the attack with a disadvantage. And I'll also say some of the folks on our Discord also mentioned this, and it's a very good point, that there's got to be that table trust that you're trying to play a fun and interesting story, not just pit monsters against characters. Yeah, so honestly, this is probably not a great approach if your DM is out to kill you with every single encounter. So if you're playing a more role-playing centric game, you know, there is that table trust. And I, I think that you could probably get away with sacrificing a single action uh, for the sake of trying to tell a story with your character. Right. And if, you know, if your character has 10 HP left and they play into it and run away and the DM responds with using all of the dragon's abilities <laughs> on you and making sure that you die on your next turn, then yeah, maybe you got to disregard some of this <laughs> conversation. Don't listen to us. Turn the podcast off now and go think about your tactics. Go read Keith Amon's book uh, about how to, how to maximize your player's <laughs> abilities. Yes. And continuing in that physiological effects discussion, uh, when you break out of Frightened, like when the condition ends... There's also some opportunity for descriptive detail. Ooh. Like your adrenaline is coming down. You can be in a huge state of irritation still, like snapping at your party members. You can have an extreme loss of energy. Your muscles are still jittery. And you have that cognitive sense of relief from being in that just pure state of mental panic. To coming out of it a little bit, being able to assess the situation with a little bit of a rational mind. I know exactly what this feels like. I actually, uh, I was walking with a friend one time and they stepped out in between two cars and a car came around a blind corner and very nearly clipped them. And I grabbed onto the back of their shirt and I kind of just like tugged them a little bit and stopped them from taking that final step, which would have absolutely have been a bloodbath. Uh, I remember the moment after that, my knees completely gave out of me. I felt like vomiting for like five minutes and all of that adrenaline coming down. That was quite a ride. Right? Like, I think we can all identify with that to some degree. For me, like if anyone drives, they've experienced it. You've come in some kind of a near hit when afterwards you're like, I feel like I can't even drive right now. I yeah. need to pull over. Yeah, deal with this, process this. Yeah. And so again... Even if you're you're still failing your saving throw, you can be doing this. You can be processing this. If you can't move any closer, you can say like you're kind of weak in the knees and you're kind of standing there and your knees, you're not you're not prone because that would be strategically disadvantaged. <laughs> but you're you're sitting there and you're like your knees are shaking and you're trying to gather the strength because you know dice willing you're about to charge in there on your next turn so you're kind of getting ready and you're you're collecting yourself ready to charge giving out one of those adrenaline blasted wheezes oh oh my <laughs> whoa that inspires uh you know a lot of confidence in your team <laughs> that's a good role play right there all right moving on to step three the choice so 
you just got out of fear, what next? Here you can make the choice if you want to kind of regroup, refocus, get back into the fray and play that heroic adventurer, or you can still lean into the fear. You can still be experiencing it as a character. So with option one, how are you gonna regroup and refocus? What's that character response in that moment? Like if you're a paladin, you got some kind of a quick prayer you're gonna say. I mean, any character can have a quick prayer they're gonna say. I mean, going back to seven, I can immediately see, you know, I can still be a badass. I can still be a, an edgelord, cool rogue warlock if I just have a moment where he swallows hard, turn one, and then turn two when he makes his save and he's he's still playing it up. He just says aloud to the rest of the party, we're all going to die someday. And then he makes his save and he runs in. Like something as simple as that adds this, you know, this moment of hesitation for what is supposed to be the ultimate badass. Yeah. And now he gets to have a moment of weakness and go, whew, and still be a badass in the end. Yeah, so like figure out your character's signature quote that could even inspire the rest of the party in that moment after fear. Love that. And again, you could be stuck in that fear response. If you know you're playing with a bunch of really devoted role players that are going to encourage you and like support your moment of fear, this can be a really fun option because this gives them the chance to step in and try to encourage you to get past it. And of course, you can be doing this for other characters that are going through the same thing. Absolutely. You have a teammate that is currently paralyzed with fear. That's your opportunity. You don't miss a beat. You still, you know, you swing your sword, you cast your spells, you move, you do whatever you want because talking is a free action. And that player needs you yeah. in that moment to encourage them to break through that fear. Whether you're telling them about that last time that you guys were in a worse situation than this, like you can get through this, get up, get up. And even if you're just repeating something like that, like that's an action movie scene. I love that On so your feet. much. <laughs> the dragon's flames are blasting through the cavern and you can barely be heard above the sheer noise of that. <laughs> I love it. That is, that's so visceral. I love, like, I can see it. I can see it in my mind. And then running on to step four, the action. So you've made your choice. Now again, lean in hard. What we're doing in this moment is we're looking for that moment of heroism. So we are going to throw caution to the wind. We are coming through. This is, you know, if we're talking about the microcosm of, a, of an entire story, we're talking about the five steps. This is the hero's triumph over the bad guy at the end. This is the bad guy being fear. Your hero just triumphed. How are they triumphing? Are they, is it just kind of like a, a single normal attack? Are you just rolling a simple D6 and spelling out the math? Or are you saying that your character is running headlong and leaps off of the rock that's in front of them? There is no reason to do that. You're doing it to emphasize <laughs> that this is the action moment. You are leaping through the air and plunging your sword into the dragon. Even if it doesn't hit, it's still badass as fuck. This is that moment that defines the choice you just made. People should be able to clearly understand your choice based on what you do in this moment. Are you turning tail and running for the door and you're clawing at it, bloodying your fingers if you're leaning into the fear? Or like you said, Travis, are you leaping down the dragon's throat? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And all we're saying is that this is your action moment. This is where you emphasize and you sell whatever that choice was. And finally, the aftermath. This is how your character feels after the fact and specifically how you're going to express it in the game. Because, I mean, I do this all day, every day, is just think the thoughts that my character is thinking, but don't <laughs> say them in the game. This is the just the one Achilles heel of every role player. It's like, how yeah. cool it would be if I did this? I'm not going to do it. I'm just going <laughs> to think it. So giving some of the possible repercussions of everything we just talked about if you overcame your fear and triumphed over that dragon as a group you can revel in your shared victory but still express to your party how absolutely rattled you were in that moment or you know again if you're playing the ultimate badass like seven 
you can sheathe your weapon and clean the blood off of it and, uh, you know, very confidently and cool, uh, you know, slip that weapon back into its sheath. But deep down, you telegraph to the rest of your players at the table. He looks queasy. He looks ill. He looks shaken like he's not okay as he calmly wipes the blood off of his sword and resheathes it. That's okay because that conveys all of this emotional drama that your character is going through in that moment. Good point. Words do not even need to be spoken. Or if you gave into your fear, you're going to come away, whether you win or lose against that dragon, maybe you're holding on to some serious shame and guilt for how your character acted, which might be either piled onto by the party or relieved if they're, you know, if you're playing that supportive group. So if you're playing along with our little game here, now you're just simply going to write down what are you going to do in the event that you make your save and how are you going to feel about it? And what are you going to do if you fail it and you have to run away and this did not go the way that your character wanted it to? So yeah, just make a quick note. Like, yeah. what are they going to go through? How would they feel in the event of a failure? How would they feel in the event of a success or a triumph? And one of the most story-driven ways to play this is... To lose. I mean, I know that sounds kind of weird, but if your character gives into their fear and you don't overcome the dragon the way you wanted to, you might just blame yourself for all of it and have some serious internal shit to overcome. I have to make it up to the rest of my party. Now you've got a mini tragic backstory that you actually played out. How cool is that? You have to prove yourself in the next three fights, which means you're going to be more reckless and more daring to try to win back the approval of the rest of the party. Yeah. Or are you going to keep exhibiting those fear symptoms until, you know, you you have a moment that helps you get out of that mindset? And really, you can play combat, even though no fear spell is being cast <laughs> on you in those preceding combats, you can still role play this. Like you can say that my character takes a brief moment before combat, you know, even if you're doing one of the like, we're going to jump out of the trees and, and ambush the goblins, your character can still telegraph that they're nervous because they recently had this failure and they're going to shake and they're going to collect themselves and they're, they're closing their eyes and they're deep breathing. And now they're going to run in. And now again, that's a story of fucking triumph of your character yeah. that they just overcame in just a quick description. Yeah, adds a lot. I know it all boils down to those little descriptions, but it adds so much to your game. And to illustrate the importance of this, there was a moment that this very same character, Seven, the ultimate badass, <laughs> should have gone through this. And it's one of the things that if I could go back and I could replay certain games, uh, I remember a specific instance where the Demogorgon, not the one from Stranger Things, but the two-headed, tentacle-armed baboon monstrosity <laughs> that stands like 30, 40 feet tall came out of a goddamn lake. And in the moment, I mean, I, as a player, was very scared. I thought, oh, shit, there's no way that we can beat this. Let's run. But there was a golden role-playing opportunity that I didn't take because there should have been ramifications of seeing shit like that. <laughs> That lasts for months, and I used none of it. Yeah, like if you were to play up, oh man, the opportunities. You're right. And it doesn't get much more golden than that, right? Like <laughs> a demon lord that's supposed to inspire you to do acts of <laughs> insanity? Like, Yeah, like this should have been the defining moment of that character. And all I did mechanically, because I was thinking mechanically at the time, I thought, okay, full action or run and i did that for <laughs> three do. or four turns and that was the amount of the role playing that i did in that moment and i wish i'd done so much more because that could have informed the next 30 sessions with that character and that's why in the next episode we're going to dive into characters that have been through the shit like you're saying travis if if your character has had that terrifying moment with demogorgon what are some role play behaviors we can lean into for that next 30 sessions or next arc, whatever you want to call it? And how can they move through or past their challenges and come out a hero on the other side? I'm so looking forward to getting into that one. 
Uh, like I said, that's the next episode, but I really, really hope that you got a lot out of this one. And if you were able to, you were jotting down alongside listing what your character does. But again, as a reminder, check out hookandchance.com. Uh, find this episode and you will find all of these steps written in our show notes. And before we leave you today, we're going to do a quick Grandma Bee's Schoolhouse about creatures in the animal kingdom of our real world that I would say cast fear. Folks come here to Grandma Bee's Schoolhouse to gain knowledge and apply the history of their realm. So this is about giving you some juicy ideas for the monsters and creatures of your D&D world, or if you're a real dark character <laughs> you can use these and you want to flex your proboscis <laughs> menacingly like yeah, i don't know <laughs> get creative don't ask sure. me there's druids out there <laughs> all right what are monsters that cast fear my first category i call making big and i submit the assassin bug so these little assholes stab prey with their proboscis and paralyze them that sucks but that's not why i'm talking about them today unrelated <laughs> oh boy <laughs> because some species prey on ants. So they stab them and suck them dry. Then they hoist that ant shell up and glue it on their back. Oh no. Then they do it again. Then they do it like 50 times. So now they're this shambling mound of ant corpses. Dear God. <laughs> and I'd say that's a that's a cast fear. I You know what? I retract that. There is no God. <laughs> <laughs> so now their predator, the jumping spider who would normally see the assassin bug as a tasty snack, takes a look and says, Sweet Jesus, I'm not <laughs> jumping on that abomination. Oh, man, that is nightmare <laughs> fuel. But if we're talking about how, like, from a mechanical kind of standpoint, how does a dragon just telegraph fear? How does just being in its presence cause fear? Having a whole bunch of bodies of your slain <laughs> enemies strapped on you like a fancy vest is one way of doing it. Like they're just stuck to you. Like like when you sleep on a bed of coins and they're all sticking to you. <laughs> just like indented in his face. Yeah. Ah, oh, I slept really hard. No, but imagine that a dragon gets up and all these corpses are falling off of them. Hell no. Oh my goodness. No, that's why you all failed your yeah. saving throws and rightly so. Or honestly, I'm thinking about one of the classic D&D monsters, a giant spider, and those are stale. But what if you take one of those edder caps, those like spider friends, I don't like and this. staple on a whole bunch of spider corpses? Yeah. That's going to be something I run away from. Uh-huh. Like 300 spider arms. So. I hate it. Burn it with fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What else you got? Uh, my next category, predatory camouflage. I submit the Atticus Atlas Moth. Ooh, I like the Atlas Moth. Yes, they're very fun, very big, and lots of moths have this clever design, but the atlas moth is uh, very good at it. The pattern on their wings looks like the eyes, nostrils, and outline of a snake's head, which is not very inviting for moth-eaten bats and birds. I mean, honestly, you know, I retract that previous statement. If there is anything that can make me think that intelligent design is possible, it's the atlas moth, because holy shit, how did you evolve that crazy <laughs> like it's not just a little bit looking like a snake head it's a lot bit looking like a snake head yeah and they even have learned to move to right you know to to convince their it's next so step cool. is becoming a snake head <laughs> <laughs> they're just slowly evolving into a snake that's yeah. the first time that's ever happened <laughs> now i know this isn't directly casting fear but it did give me the idea of like if you're going through a dungeon and you know what you're hunting like let's say you're going in there to find an umber hulk sure well could there be some creatures some bats and who knows giant moths in there that are you know red herring in you in the walls because they don't want to get eaten so they look like the head of that creature so all of a sudden one a party member is just like i'm blasting that <laughs> oh my goodness yeah you see the umber hulk's eyes yeah glinting from the darkness like and that's simply uh you know a bat or you know the the reflection of you know some kind of scaly bat wing or you know it's just anything yeah but you're seeing them all over the place i think that could be really fun to toy with your party 
and you didn't even give the Umber Hulk a special camouflage ability. It's just other creatures that happen <laughs> to look like the Umber Hulk. So now every time you're trying to discern if it's the Umber Hulk or a moth, and all of a sudden the Umber Hulk jumps at you from another angle. <laughs> Fuck. I like it. My final category I call making weapons out of bones, and I bring forth the hairy frog. Oh, no. I, no, I think I know which one you're <laughs> talking about. So, yes, they're hairy, but that's not their, their worst feature. They're also known as the horror frog, by the way. <laughs> so, you know it's going to be good. <laughs> uh, what does the horror frog do? Well, it's got claws, kind of like Wolverine. Okay. They come out of its skin. No. The frogs should not have that. Who gave this frog ad- adamantine claws? <laughs> well, they're not adamantine. They're, they're bones. Terrifying. Right. But it's extra horrible because unlike Wolverine, they don't have special bones for this purpose. Uh, no, I hate this. <laughs> so instead, they break their toe bones and jam oh, them Jesus. through the skin. And once they're done mauling whatever the hell they're mauling with these <laughs> toe bones, <laughs> they don't retract them. They just wait for them to heal and pull themselves back in. Sorry. We're sorry we did this to you. But we hope you got some value from the first bit, uh, even though you got nightmare fuel from the last. Hey, I think there's some serious value packed into that nightmare fuel. (laughs) That's what I live for. Well, speaking of terrifying creatures that stalk dungeons, our wonderful patrons stalk our Discord, so you should come and hang out with them. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful patrons. You are all nightmare fuel to us. No, that's wow. that's not right. Well, uh, we're not cutting it. <laughs> you said it. Just let her roll. <laughs> thank you very much to Gar the Pirate. Time Warp. Nico Y. Zach G. No Ma'am. Michelle T. Hentenius. Alan E. Matthew T. Felix R. Chris F. The Senate. Lucas T. Lila G. The GM Tim. Thomas W. Tyler G. Ty N. Heavy Arms. Eric R. Aldros. Leprechaun. And Will HP. Thank you all so much. You make things possible. Thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects you heard in this episode. You can follow us at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit. And you can join a wonderful community of players and DMs always swapping stories and advice and making each other's games better on our Discord. Thanks for listening, and keep your bones in your toes. Yes, please.